Dieser Podcast ist Teil des Podcast-Netzwerks DBPDW, die besten Podcasts der Welt. Hello and welcome to another episode of Trek am Freitag, Trek on Fridays. My name is Sebastian. This very special episode of our podcast is going to be in English. Liebe rein deutschsprachige Zuhörerinnen und Zuhörer, tut mir leid, aber nächsten Dienstag sind wir ja wieder auf Deutsch. In February of this year, our podcast did a special episode discussing three original series Star Trek novels. One of them was Strangers from the Sky by New York Times bestselling author Margaret Wanda Bonanno. Today I'm very happy to present an interview I recently did with Margaret. Just one word of note. Our connection was really, really bad. And during our recording session, Margaret to me sounded like she was underwater talking with an echo. That was due to technical difficulties beyond our control. It made it very hard for me to understand what she was saying, but with a bit of concentration I could always figure it out. Unfortunately, this prevented the interview from becoming a natural back and forth conversation because I was more or less squinting my eyes and my ears trying to understand what she was saying. The actual recording you're listening to now suffered from less distortions, but it is still far from being crystal clear, and there are still dropouts where it is hard to understand what Margaret is saying. But I think all the ideas that she tried to bring across did come across. I for one think that the interview turned out really fascinating, as it is, with lots of insights into the work of a Star Trek author. So, now, enough apologizing. If there are any international listeners around who are not regular listeners of our podcast, please stay tuned during the German opening credits. The interview to follow is going to be in English. Der Star Trek Podcast mit Simon und Sebastian. Normalerweise besprechen wir jeden Dienstag eine Star Trek Episode. Aber heute gibt's eine Sonderfolge. Ihr hört Trek am Freitag. First of all, Margaret, thank you very much for taking the time to doing this little interview with me. Oh, you're welcome. I welcome the opportunity. Margaret, I was wondering um, for our listeners, could you please give a quick introduction about who you are and what you have to do with Star Trek? Well, I'm a, I was a Star Trek novelist, which is not quite the same as being a screenwriter. Screenwriters have a union and they get the big bucks. The novelists have to pitch the story the same way a screenwriter does, but uh, the way I figured it was this. Um, oh, ancient history. Back in the 70s, early 80s, I wrote a couple of serious novels, and then my publisher went bankrupt nicely. And so I sat down with my agent, and I said, what else can I do? And he said, well, how are you? Mysteries, and, you know, romance. I said, no, no, uh I said, but I can write Star Trek. I'm grown. He said, oh, God, please. They only put out six books a year. I said, yeah, but I can't do hard science. I'm a literature major. I never took physics. But, you know, with Star Trek, it's all built in. And I've loved the characters since I was in high school. So why not? And, oh, kept pitching one story after another and finally uh, got in with Dwellers in the Crucible. Then the editor quit. Uh, the subsequent editor managed to lose the manuscript. So I had to, and this was pre-computers, so I had to retype the whole bloody thing, uh, pardon my language, and um, but sent it in, and it sold. Again, only six books a year. And so then they were like, oh, and meanwhile, another editor had quit. A new one came in, and he said, so what would you like to write next? I said, what do you have in mind? He said, well, we're putting out what we call giant Trek novels, which are big, fat novels, which are going to cost more, of course. And the first one was um, Vonda McIntyre's Enterprise, I think. Yeah. Can you write yeah. something that big? I said, yes, try and stop me. <laughs> But we wrangled back and forth because, uh, as I say, I can't do science. So I said, how about time travel? 
I don't understand that either, but he said, well, you got to put Kirk and Spock in there. Got to put. So we sort of mangled together this these two different plot lines, which is why sometimes it doesn't make any sense, but um, that's how it happened. I thought it was quite clear what happened in uh, Strangers from the Sky, which actually is one of my favorite track books, which is why I chose to revisit it after 25 years for our February podcast we did about track novels. Wow. Each of us chose one, and I chose your novel, actually, which is why I'm um, quite chuffed to be talking to you today. It seems to be a lot of people's favorites. It was... Dare I brag a little, it was on the New York Times bestseller list for five weeks, I think. Wow. And everybody was like, oh my God, you're a bestseller. No, I'm not a bestselling novelist. Star Trek is what sells this thing. His name is on it. Of course, I was wrong because the fans can tell. But yeah, that was my, my glory days, 1987. How was it, Margaret, to go ahead with novels or to be the only persons who were regularly supplying Star Trek, apart from the movies that were only coming about every two or three years. How did it feel to carry the torch? Well, it was wonderful because there was this hunger. People were like, there's nothing on screen except reruns in the middle of the night. We need something. And so, you know, they rushed to the bookstores as soon as it was out. There were bookstores in those days. And so, again, it wasn't me, it was Star Trek. And it's like, okay, this is a realm, this is a world I know. I can't read hard science fiction, I can't do the physics. But, I mean, I know Spock like a brother, so it was important to me. I don't know if it was an ego thing, it was just fun and very good money. Back in the day, uh, when there were only six novels, you got paid very well. These days... Um, There are dozens of them, and people just don't make much money. I'm out of the picture, but that's another a story for another day. But it was it was great while it lasted. Do you still get paid when people buy the ebooks? Actually, no. The only this is funny. The only thing I still get a tiny little royalty from is the audio book of Strangers from the Sky, which again was done in 1987, and it's a much abbreviated version of the book, but it was narrated by George Takei, who does amazing voices. Um, he can do a high-pitched southern accent, or he can do James Earl Jones, uh, and then the frame narrative uh, was done by Leonard Nimoy, and of course, now that he's not here, people, I don't know where, maybe in Japan, are still buying these books, so I'll get a, a royalty for $4.71. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, no, nothing else is selling. Since your book, Strangers from the Sky, deals a lot with uh, time hopping and non-linearity, I'd like to track back a bit now and find out how and when did you become a Star Trek fan, actually? Um, first time I saw Spock on screen, which was, you know, the pilot, and I was 16 and you know, couldn't get a date, and it's like, oh, my, who is this person? Um, and yeah, he was always my focus. Yeah, that's a big thing, actually. A lot of early fandom was female and fans of Spock, so to say. The whole I grok Spock movement. Exactly, because he was so different from the boys we knew. It's like, all right, he's not groping me. He's not staring down my shirt. Uh, he's looking me in the eye, and he's explaining things. Where have they been keeping him all my life? <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, going back to the giant novel experience, this was a strange time for pocketbooks when they were not quite ready to do hardcovers, but they were doing novels that were twice the size of a regular novel. How did that come about? See, that was a marketing decision. I don't know anything about that. I guess they figured um, the fans are not going to spend enough money for a hardcover, except the collectors, you know. They buy them and they don't read them. They just put them in plastic sleeves and put them on the shelf. Uh, and if they're really lucky, they can get them autographed. But um, the ones that sell are the soft covers because people read them and reread them and reread them. I've had people tell me, uh, I've worn the covers off mine. Can you please sign it anyway? <laughs> That's the greatest compliment that you've read it over and over. 
And the feedback I get from fans is, oh, there was a guy who had had several cancer treatments, and he was so weak after the chemotherapy that he couldn't sit up. So his wife got one of those hospital trays, turned it upside down, and taped the book to the bottom of the tray so that she could turn the pages for him so he could read. And I mean, things like that just bring tears to your eyes. Oh, dear, yeah. I can only tell you that I loved my uh, German version of it uh, to, to bits because I ha I have it sitting here. Fremde vom Himmel, it's called. You know, I, I wonder, they sent me a few copies of that. I wonder if I still have them. Um, if so, uh, maybe I can send you an autographed copy. Oh, that would be so nice. But I'll have to look. I mean, everything is just buried in boxes all over the place, but I will look. No promises, but if I have it, I'm okay. <laughs> That would be nice. Oh, and as for the lack of linearity in my narratives, I'm half Irish. I think in Celtic knots. I can't write a straight narrative, and it drives editors crazy. It drives readers crazy. I get notes from people on Facebook saying, I don't understand your book. Well, read it, read it slowly, honey, you know, <laughs> small bites. Um, I don't know how to write from point A to point B. I have to kind of take little side trips to point A1 and A16 and then come back. That's just how my mind works. Well, I have to pay you a compliment there because I feel that the novel itself is crystal clear. When I tried to summarize it for our podcast a few months ago, I failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't ask me to do it because I don't know. You know, it's people always ask me, what's your of all the things you've written, what's your favorite? And it's like, The one I'm working on now, which, again, drives me crazy. It's always a work in progress. And sometimes I look back at something and it's like, I wrote that? Really? Or, oh my God, I wrote that? Really? So, I don't know. I'm not religious, but I get the feeling that there's something out there that's saying, hey, wake up, write this. And unfortunately, I haven't been doing any writing lately, just personal issues, which is why It took me so long to get back to you. Uh, my partner is an insulin-dependent diabetic. I have to nag him to take his shots four times a day. And so, yeah, that's my life right now. Sorry to hear that, Margaret. I hope I hope that you somehow find the time to give us just another uh, Star Trek novel in the future. Um, yeah, I don't think so, because the, uh, the personnel and pocketbooks have changed so much. The last one I wrote was Unspoken Truth. And just as I was finishing it, pocketbooks reorganized, and I'm putting that in quotes, basically they just fired the two best editors on the Star Trek program, both of whom have gone on to better things. Um, Marco Palmieri is senior editor at Tor Books. Uh, Margaret Clark still reads the Trek novels and recommends them, but she can't work on them as an editor. And I don't even know who's in charge anymore. And I don't think they care because they want, you know, battleships and, you know, big blowing up things. I can't do that sort of thing anymore. Uh, David George can write that sort of thing. Uh, David Mack, of course, destroys whole planets in his spare time. So that's the kind of thing they're looking for. They're not looking for character stories, which is really all I know how to do. Oh, that's too bad. My favorite book of yours, actually, is Burning Dreams. Oh, that was such a gift. Um, Again, it was Marco Palmieri. He understood my strengths. And he said, I'm basically looking for a biography of Christopher Pike. Can you do that? And I said, you know, I've always wondered because I know Roddenberry threw that story together so quickly. There's so many unanswered questions. Why does he want to go back to Talos IV? Why couldn't Vina come back to Earth? So I love filling in all of that stuff. I guess <laughs> I'm more of a biographer than a Star Trek novelist or something. Burning Dreams for me had this kind of dreamlike quality. This book about the haunted captain, that was really, really nice. And it actually moved me. Well, thank you so much. Because um, I was also looking at um, Jeffrey Hunter's tragic story. He died so young and he had so much potential, but... Quite frankly, he was not Captain Kirk, so I'm glad they had to make a different decision. But still, I wanted to know, who was this guy? And what's the, the attachment to Tango, to the horse? That's, 
you know, his spirit guide or whatever, and then to create a whole backstory, because what did we know about him? He grew up in the desert, um, joined Starfleet, and... Oh, you have those two. There was one going by just before I called you. Plus, they're doing construction. <sighs> anyway, where were we? Ah, uh, yeah, Christopher Pike. Haunted guy, really, and I tried to capture that. And, of course, Vena. It's like, okay, with the technology that they had in the 21st century, why couldn't they bring her back to Earth? Why couldn't they fix her up? So there had to be some reason why she wanted to stay there. And then to have them rejoined after all that time, and Spock, of course, facing another court-martial. But that Spock, he does these things that are, you know, not out of character, per se, but it's like, oh, well, these are human rules. Who cares? How many times has Kirk broken the rules? You know? So, yes, it was, I think it was easy to write. And, of course, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but a great portion of it was based on the movie Crimson Tide, which is one of my favorites. And so the idea of the younger officer defying the older officer and risking court-martial. And I even made the, I don't remember the name of the captain in Burning Dreams, but I made him look like Gene Hackman. I couldn't make Christopher Pike look like Denzel Washington, but, um, you know, it was the same kind of spirit. And, of course, people who love both the book and the movie said, ha, 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 I saw what you did there. You stole that from Crimson Tide. I said, well, What's his name? Oh, God. The late Clark Bennett, who, in my view, saved Star Trek, because if it wasn't for the Wrath of Khan, the thing would die. Clark Bennett used to say, steal from the best. And he had a wonderful story about the ending of um, the Search for Spock, where Spock suddenly recognizes Kirk in one of his comrades. And he said, it's the scene in where she runs out to the water pump, and she's feeling the water, and she says, wow, 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 wow. She remembered being a baby and saying that word. And from there, all of her language skills came back, even though she couldn't hear or see. And so the idea of Spock looking at Kirk and saying, your name was Jim, all his memories came back from that. And I thought, yeah, okay, this this is going to be my guru. Har Bennett is going to be my guru, and I'm going to steal from the best. And I do that in all of my books. Going back a bit, maybe to Strangers in the Sky, or to something you said earlier, that you are less of a, let's say, sciency writer and more of a writer who feels her way into the story. In Strangers, I feel that you had a straightforward thriller, more or less, in the 21st century sections with those algae farmers and U-boat captains and terrorists and the media. And in the 23rd century, Jim Kirk and Spock were dealing with Aboriginal dream time and nightmares and wizards who live backwards in time. How did that juxtaposition come about? Was that done intentionally? Oh, yeah. See, again, I've always wanted to write thrillers, but once they get you typecast, oh, well, she's a science fiction writer, they will not let you write a thriller. I've self-published a thriller, which unfortunately I should have finished a little earlier before the election of 2016. Um, because it's about a president who seems evil in the novel, but compared to what we have now, and I shouldn't say this on an open frequency, um, because the black helicopters will come for me any moment, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to write a thriller, but nobody was buying a thriller from me. So I said, all right, I'll just squish it into a Star Trek novel. And then there was a book, and I can't remember, huge, huge book about Australia that I was reading at the time. And the idea of the Aborigines learning the lay of the land by walking it, by saying, okay, that tree is over there, this rock is over here, if I go so many footsteps here, there'll be a mountain. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I had to use that. And, of course, somebody at Paramount took exception to that. We will not mention names. and. You know, whales, of course, were being hinted at for the next movie. So I have to throw in some stuff about whales. What else were we going with this? Well, yeah. Oh, and the wizard living backwards. That was T.H. White's Once in Future King, I think, where Merlin was living backwards. So I said, right, I'm going to steal that too. <laughs> so yeah. uh, there we are. I'm not, I'm not so much a writer as a thief. Let's call it homage. 
Oh. <laughs> you did it so masterfully, so I can only um, give you credit there, even though you may have borrowed one or two motives here and there. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that. About the terrorists, you have um, the German name terrorist Recher, and you have Easter and their concerts. And I find it fascinating that in the novel they get a lot of build-up, but in the end they self-destruct as if they can't exist in the future, more or less. You've hit it exactly. That's exactly what I was going for. Thank you. Because I wanted to say, okay, Earth is not completely peaceful. There are always going to be these little rats in the corner who are kind of trying to stir up trouble. And um, they can't do it. They can't get a following anymore. And they get stranded in uh, Antarctica. And the best they can do is kill penguins. Which, the more I think of it, um, is pretty much what we're doing to Earth today. Not that I'm any kind of seer or anything, but, you know, this is human nature. <laughs> my late husband had a, a saying, and again, pardon my French, he said, people are like a bull in the china shop. If they don't break, they shit on. <laughs> you can bleep that out if you need to. I don't know what you censorship laws are where you are. Oh, no, we're, we're completely uncensored. You can say what you want. That's great. I've noticed that in the UK as well. It's only America that's so stuffy. But, you know, it's our Puritan heritage, I guess. You know, it's just my brain is a compost heap. I just throw everything in there and let it ferment and see what pops up. Um, right now I'm trying, she said, well, I've, I've finished the first volume, trying to write a book about a little girl living in Edwardian London suddenly discovers she can turn into a cat. And so the people who are working on the peace movement, think, wouldn't she make a great spy? You know, she can hide behind the curtains at all these diplomatic functions and listen in and report back. But I only got the first volume done. It only goes up to 1912. So, uh, and there's a wonderful, see, again, I'm going to steal from this. What was the name of that movie? Oh, Sarajevo. It's about why Why World War I started, really, it had nothing to do with politics. It had to do with the fact that the generals wanted a railroad from Berlin to Baghdad. And if they had to mow down everybody in their path, that's what they were going to do. And I don't know how accurate that is, but damn, I'm going to use that. So, you know, it's always about money. Always. Any chance you will revisit that in the future? Ah, uh, I will when I get my life organized. See, the sad thing about being a writer at my level is you never actually earn a living as a writer. You also have to have a day job. And um, I do copy editing on the side. And thanks to the current administration, a lot of people are cutting back on their copy editing. I worked for a wonderful medical company that said, um, well, gee whiz, we've had budget cuts because of you know, the administration and We can't use you anymore. So I've been scrounging for work ever since. Once I get that set and get my partner to remember, okay, you take this shot in the morning, you take that shot in the afternoon. And if you don't take that one before dinner, you're not getting any dinner. I just hope it works out. I guess I would just like to find out. I know a bit about what happened, but I'd really like to hear from you. Whatever happened with Cliente and Tashale Oh. And probe. Oh, yes, probe. Well, all right. Since you're on my Facebook page, um, I have a separate page that tells the whole history of my writing career from 1978 to the current moment. And it's in there somewhere. It tells the whole story uh, as diplomatically as I can because I don't want to be sued, even though, again, one of the parties in question is dead and the other one is not working for pocketbooks anymore. But You know, I don't want lawsuits. I have nothing for them to take if they sue me, but I don't need annoyance. Um, and I'm on a couple of message boards, and people are always pestering me. Is it so-and-so? Is it so-and-so? Is this the one who, you know, got you in trouble with music of the spheres? I'm not at liberty to say. Figure it out for yourself. But, yeah, it's all in there. I have a separate page called My Back Pages. Very, very original. And, yeah, if you just want to wade through God, I don't know how many pages of entries, or just, you know, do a search for it, or send me your email. If you want to have your email address, I will send you just the abbreviated version. Basically, what happened was someone was in charge at Pocket, 
Roddenberry was very ill at the time, and this person became his spokesperson, became his, oh, basically was doing things in Roddenberry's name, and Roddenberry knew nothing about it. And so memos would come down to pocketbooks from, you know, signed by Gene Roddenberry, and everybody knew Roddenberry's not, you know, he's not well. He's not yeah, right. Well. Not saying. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, but still, these dictates had to be obeyed. And one novel was destroyed outright. A woman named Irene Press wrote something. Oh, and there's another uh, link I can send you that tells you about all of the, uh, the Trek novels that didn't happen. And Brad Ferguson, who's a good buddy of mine, wrote a perfectly decent novel, but Somebody took umbrage, and that somebody, by the way, was running around at conventions saying that women should not be allowed to write Star Trek because they just don't have the right feel for it. So, Tell that to DC Fontana. <laughs> well, this person didn't dare cross Dorothy because she'd stab him in the heart. But uh, And yeah, again, see, there's a different tier. The script writers have a different status than the novelists. Although some of us... Peter David has made crossover. A couple of other people have pitched a story, and somebody said, hey, that would make a good script. Can you turn it into a script? I'm not one of those people. And I've been told by a handful of fans, now, I didn't watch Enterprise. I really didn't, even though a good friend of mine had a small part in two episodes, I think. I did watch his episodes, but uh, Carbon Creek, everybody says, well, you know, your story should have been there instead of Carbon Creek. You know, Carbon Creek was written, what, 20 odd years later, and it's too late now. But, you know, if any of you happen to like to make fan videos, I wouldn't complain. So, yeah, it's crazy. But, yeah, um, I will send you links to the whole story, and we'll take it from there. And also, you will send me your address, and if I have a copy of... Uh, What's it called in German? Fremde, <laughs> Fremde vom Himmel. Yeah, yeah. There you See, go. I, I took German in college, which was before you were born, so I don't remember much. But this has been lovely. Yeah. If you're ever in the... See, I don't go to conventions anymore. I'm not invited to conventions anymore. But if you ever happen to be in Southern California, give me a shout. I know a very nice restaurant with a variety of beers and some good seafood. It's down on the pier overlooking the ocean, um, so we could meet there. Thank you so much. Whenever I'm in the States and California, I w I'll definitely give you a shout. Margaret, thank you so much for talking to your German fans. There's uh, quite a few who, who are looking forward to listening to this interview. Well, this has been a joy. Thank you so much. Eine Track am Dienstag 2019 Produktion.